Today we're going to start our last section in Chapter 10. Um, chapter 10 talks so far about um, basically graphing data, right? We were looking at um, data from a graphical perspective. And we're going to continue that idea of examining data inside of Section 10.4. Um, this is measures of central tendency and variation. Um, so the first measure of central tendency you've used a lot in your life. It's called the mean. It's also called the arithmetic mean. If this is the average of the values, and you find it by adding all the values together and dividing by the total number of values. So a variation of this is what happens with your grade in the class, right? In fact, probably all your classes have something that uses the arithmetic mean. Um, you take all of the things that you've done, there's maybe a weighting system in play, um, but you're adding a bunch of things together and dividing by how many of them you have in some way, shape, or form. That's a mean. So this is one way to find um, a measure of central tendency. Another way of finding a measure of central tendency is the median. The median is the middle number, uh, and it's found by listing all the numbers in numerical order. There's a little bit of a catch to finding the median. If it's the middle number and there's an odd number of values, there's a middle number, right? If you put five kids in a row, you know, one, two, three, four, five, there's one kid that's in smack dab middle. But if you have an even number of values, think about having six kids in a row, there's sort of two kids that are in the middle, right? So what happens when we have an even number of values is we take the two middle values and we find their mean. They're average, like we just talked about before. Sometimes that ends up being the same value as one of those, you know, the same value as those two values. Sometimes it doesn't, it just depends. Um, but that's how we deal with it if we have two middle numbers. Now again, think about if we, if we had everybody stand up and we went from tallest to shortest in the class, median, what it would do is it would tell you the halfway point. So you could find that person that's in the halfway point in terms of height, and you could say that half the people in the class are below this height and half the people in the class are above this height. That's what median does for you. Your mean doesn't do that. If you add all your values together and you divide by whatever, it doesn't always tell you that that's the middle value of all the values you've been getting in the class. Um, if you have a very extremely high grade you know, thrown in there or a very extremely low grade in there, it can shift that so that it doesn't end up being the same as the median would have been. Uh, and then the last one we talk about is mode. The number or numbers, can be more than one, that occur most frequently. This one's the one that people seem to um, have a little bit of difficulty understanding why this would be a measure of central tendency. So imagine that you were trying to find out how much money is made by the employees working in a specific school district, right? You're thinking about applying there. What's the average salary kind of thing? Well, it probably wouldn't be too helpful to find the mean. And the reason is because the superintendent's salary is going to be thrown into that. And the principal, right? that might not give you the best representation of what you would actually make starting there. Now, even put yourself in a different position than that. Let's say you were starting not even in the role of teacher, but you were starting in the role of like some sort of administrative assistant or a janitor. Well, it wouldn't make any sense at all then, right? Like you would not expect to get the average because your role that you're playing in that position wouldn't, wouldn't fit. So the mode actually calculates how many of what specific type of number you're looking at. So if the majority of the people are making, you know, $30,000, but you have the superintendent who's making $100,000, you don't want his number throwing that in there and making it look like something it's not. So mode could be thought of in that way as a better idea. Um, oftentimes you see median used, and I don't exactly know why, but you see median used when they talk about family income, the median family income. Have you ever heard that phrase before? People like to use that one too, and I think it's for the same reason. That millionaire next door, we want to throw his number out. <laughs> We're not interested in how his number is going to skew the, the data kind of thing. So that's another one where you see median used in everyday life. All right, so we're going to do some calculations. I've got just a random set of data for us to practice with. 
it doesn't have too many values because I don't want us to get too bogged down in the calculation itself, but more about how we do the calculation. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the mean. So what we really want to do is we want to add these values together. So 18 plus 22, whoa, 22s, plus another 22, plus 17, plus 30, plus 18, plus 12. And then we need to divide by how many of them there are. So how many of them are there? There are seven of them. Um, you can either write this out, or if it were too many values that you felt like it was sort of unnecessary to write them all out, you could also just tell me what the sum is. But you need to have either this one or this one written down as the work you're showing. So what do you get if you add all these together? I don't even have the sum written down on my paper. What you guys get? Okay, that's what I have too, good. So 139 divided by seven is what? All right, and we'll go with two decimals for what we're doing um, in everything in this section. We'll come back to that. So 19.86, whatever it is we're calculating for, 19.86. That's our mean. Our median. Now, this is a common mistake people make is to forget to put them in order. Median only works if they go in order from least to greatest, or you could do greatest to least if it suits your fancy. But you got to put them in order or it doesn't make any sense, okay? Um, so if I put them in order from least to greatest, so I have 12, 17, 18, 18, 22, and 30. What's that? Oh, I left one off. Thank you. Two 22s and then a 30. Better. Okay, there's an odd number of values, right? I've got seven of them. So there really is a middle value. What is the middle value here? 18, and specifically it's the second 18, I think, right? Um, and so it balances because that, that, that box, if you will, has three numbers before it and three numbers after it, so that makes sense. So our median is 18. And then our mode. What number or numbers occur most frequently? Yeah, there's actually two of them. There's 18 and 22. So we would actually call that bimodal. Um, so if you see that, that word used, you'll know what that means. It just means there's two modes. Um, but you can have, and you can have no mode. If they all occur the same number of times, so let's say they all occur twice or all occur once, then there's just no mode. But if there's anything that occurs more than anything else, we've got mode and we've got to figure out which one occurs the most or which ones occur the most. Okay, any questions so far? So that's a direct question based on the rules that we've pre presented before. Example two takes something and it creates something a little bit more complicated. Um, this says the mean score on a set of 20 tests is 75. What is the sum of the 20 test scores? So it talks about mean. And if you'll remember, the way we defined mean is that mean is the sum of our scores divided by the number of scores. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, that's what we're doing. We sum everything up and we divide by the number of scores or the number of points possible or, or whatever we're doing. So in this problem, they actually give me the mean, 75, and they give me the number of scores. It's 20. So those are the places where I'm going to evaluate in. I'm going to put a 75 here. I have my sum that I don't know on top here, and I have 20 scores. So I'm not finding individual scores, I'm just finding the sum. So what would I do to solve this for the sum? Yep, I would multiply by 20. All right, so 75 times 20 is what? 1,500 is correct. So the sum of the scores is 1,500. Okay, now we're going to take that idea just a little bit further. 
This problem talks about uh, football. I don't know if, how much you know about football. I know very little, but I can do the problem, so it'll be all right. Um, if the mean weight of seven linesmen on a team is 230 pounds and the mean weight of the four backfield members is 190 pounds, what is the mean of the 11-person team? So what we're trying to find out eventually is what is the overall mean, and what we want is we want their total weight divided by what? How many of them there are? How many of them are there total? There are 11. Okay, is everybody good so far? Okay, that's the basic idea that we're trying to do. Um, the total weight on top, of course, is given to us in a different fashion than before. It says that we have the mean weight of seven of them is 230. Well, what that actually tells us is that we're going to do something like this for those folks, right? We were given the mean, and we were given the total number of people, and I need to find their total weight. So what did I end up having to do to do that over here? I multiplied the mean by the people, right, the number of people. So my mean weight over here is 230. And there are seven gentlemen whose weight is all at that average. And they're not all 230 pounds, but that's the average weight. And we're going to add that to the backfielders. So the backfield members are four of them, and they are at a 190. So we're doing the same thing for them, 190 times that four. And we will divide all of that by 11. So go ahead and multiply the tops and add it up. And we'll divide by 11. What did you get? Two hundred fifteen point four five. Now this has context. What is this that I found? Yep. But how is the weight being measured? It's in pounds. So at the very least, the units are pounds, and we need to write those in. If we were asked to interpret it, then we would do like what you just said, Gracie, where we would be a little bit more descriptive. Is that all right? Okay, so the title of our section was uh, Central Tendency and Variation. So this sort of ends the central tendency part. We're going to move into the variation part now. Um, variation, it talks about how things are spread out from the mean. How much is our data spread out? Okay, so um, you can kind of imagine having um, a couple and um, they're both about the same height, right? Let's say that they are both six foot, because I can do the numbers pretty quick in my head. They're six foot tall, both of them, the husband and the wife or whatever. All right. Well, there's a certain sort of a variation that they lack. They're exactly the same in terms of their height, right? It doesn't vary. But if you talk about like their average height, it's six foot, okay? So their average height's six foot, but there's no variation. I could also have a six foot five gentleman and a five foot, what would I have to be at, eight? I need to subtract off five, is that eight? Yeah, I think I'd be at five eight for a woman. Okay, so if you had a five eight woman and a six foot five man, they would still average to a six foot height, but the variation is different, right? They're not the same height and they average together to be the same. They're different heights, but they average together to be that same six foot. So we're looking at how things are different from their mean when we look at variation. The first type of variation we're talking about is called the range. Um, the range is just the difference between the greatest and the least value in a data set. Uh, if I were looking at this previous problem over here, I know I'll come back to this, I promise. My greatest value was a 30 and my least value is a 12. So range would just be to subtract the 30 minus the 12, okay? So that's range. 
the next three kind of all go together. Range incorporates with them, but the next three definitely all go together. Um, this talks about splitting the group up into quartiles. So what I'd like to give you a picture of again in your mind is having all those kids standing up in front of you in late, least to greatest height. All right. So we, we did the median before. The median was the halfway point. Well, the median corresponds to this one that says middle quartile. The middle quartile is just the same as the median. It's the 50% mark. It's the place where we divide the class in half. The lower and the upper quartiles is where we divide them into quarters, hence the word quartile. So they're the 25% mark and the 50, and 75, excuse me, percent mark. So again, it's sort of like the median of the lower half and the median of the upper half, right? We take it and we divide it in half again. A few more of these. The inner quartile range is just the difference between the first quartile and the third quartile. So again, it's a subtraction issue. Take Q3, take Q1, subtract them. Our lower extreme is just the smallest data set value, and the upper extreme is the largest one. And all of this is building up to what's called a box plot. So we have another graph here. Um, a box plot can be created using the lower quartile, the median, the upper quartile, the inner quartile range, IQR, and the lower and the upper extremes. So all those new things that I just introduced, if we combine them all into one single graph, they create what's called a box plot. Um, some books will call it a box and whisker plot. You may have heard that phrase before. Our book just calls it a box plot. Have you heard that before? Yeah, it's the same thing. So we're going to take a look at that same data set that we did before, 18, 22, and so forth. And we're going to create the box plot. So the first thing we want to do is what we did before with medium is what median is what we put them in order. So we're going to put them in order. We have 12, 17, 18, 18, 22, 22, and 30. And again, we had already identified that this is the median. Um, actually, let me call it Q2, just for the sake of being able to label in a moment. So when I have an odd number of data points like I have here, and I've identified that middle point as Q2, I only look at the remaining three data points when I look for the median again. So I'm only looking at what doesn't get included with the median. Um, this is a little different if you have four uh, an even number of data points. So like imagine we had the same data set, but we had an additional number on the end. I don't care what it is. But we actually had to say, well, the middle value is happening here and in, right? That's the halfway point. And we found out nicely that that was the number 20. Okay, well then all the numbers still here would be considered when we looked at the median, again, for the second time to find Q1. And the same thing over here. So we don't throw things out. But on the one that we're doing, we throw out the 18 because it's already been identified as Q2. Everybody good with that? Okay, looking then at the first three data values, what's my middle value? Yeah, 17. So my 17 is Q1. And looking at my upper three values, what is my Q3? 22. All right, just a few other things. Um, we'll write them down, we know them, but what is my lower extreme? Mm-hmm. And my upper extreme. Yes, 30, you're right. Sorry, it's taking me a little tread down. Um, those are really the values we need to be able to make a box plot. So to make a box plot, you're going to draw a number line. The number line will occur below your graph just to give it scale. That's all it's really for. Okay, it's not a part of the graph um, itself, like it doesn't touch the graph. 
Um, we need to have the lower extreme marked and we need to have our data um, spread out appropriately. So equally spaced and so forth. So I don't do this. I don't go 12, 17, 18, 20, 22. Like I don't do that. That doesn't work like that. Whatever they are, they need to be equally spaced for the actual unit values, not because I have that many data points. So here's the number 12 and I have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So I'm just going to label the 17 because I'm going to need it in a minute and 18. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. So you can choose to label what you choose to label. Um, you don't necessarily have to do this. You could make them every five units or whatever you want. It's not a big deal. Um, but I just want to make sure that I was able to find them easier without counting. <laughs> that was my goal. Okay, so what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you put above this axis a dot at each of the locations that we've identified. So we're going to have a dot at Q1, at Q2, at Q3, at the lower extreme, at the upper extreme. So there will be a dot at 12, some distance above. There will be a dot at 17 and at 18. They should all sort of be on the same horizontal, just to kind of keep it straight. I need a dot at 22 and at 30. Those are just giving us the spacing of it so that we get it right. The dot at the beginning and the dot that goes, whoa, that was bad. These two dots get connected with the line segment and so do the last two. Okay, those are the whiskers when people talk about it being a box and a whisker plot. So I, I do like that visual. And what happens in the middle at the three dots that are still unattached is that I have horizontal, I'm sorry, vertical line pieces like this. And they form a box, like so. That's my box. So there's my box, there's my whiskers. So let me talk a little bit about what this tells you. Oh, let me put a title on it first. We need a title. Um, I'm just going to write the word title because we don't have any units on this, but that way you remember that when you have data, you know, that has context, you'll have units. Yes, ma'am? It doesn't matter. You can put it wherever, wherever you have space. Um, so what does this data tell, I mean, what does this picture tell you? Well, it shows you where the halfway point is very easily, right? It's that the vertical line in the middle of the box. Um, it also tells you how things are bunching up more. I mean, I know these aren't a whole lot of data values, but imagine that you had a bunch. It would tell you that there's a lot of um, space right here, right? This variation over here in this quartile is a lot bigger than the variation here. This variation is only by one. This variation is by what? Five, four, four, excuse me, right? So we've got much more variation over here than we have over here. It tells you that the variation on the ends are pretty long too. Right? I have these values that are very spread out, except for this one quartile where the, the values are bunching up. Right? I know it sounds sort of funny to say it that way because I don't have very many values to do it with, but the more values you have, the more it starts to make sense that those details are useful. All right, that's actually a really good place for us to stop. So we're gonna stop right there. Um, the next parts that we do um, are very well connected, and so I'd like to do them in the same lesson.